Released by Atlas in 2006 on the PlayStation 2, Shin Megami Tensei Persona 3 would be the next main title in the series, taking place 10 years after the events of Persona 2. Written and directed by Katsura Hashino alongside Yuichiro Tanaka, the game would receive an epilogue in its enhanced version called Persona 3 FES, short for Festival, and an alternate remake of the main story in a port called Persona 3 Portable. The story only gets larger from here, so let's cut it down to size with a recapitation. As the game begins, a stoic blue-haired boy with headphones named Makoto Yuki takes a late train to the dorm of the new school where he's transferring to on Tatsumi Port Island. As the clock strikes midnight, a familiar blue butterfly is present as all technology ceases to function and everyone seems to transform into a coffin, yet Makoto is unfazed as he arrives at the dorm. A strange little boy greets him, stating how he was waiting a long time for Makoto and urges him to begin things by signing his name into a contract, accepting responsibility for his actions. Please, the little boy disappears as a confident girl named Mitsuru Kurijo welcomes Makoto, introducing another girl in pink as Yukari, who guides Makoto to Gekko Khan High School, also called Gekko High, the next day. A junior in high school, Makoto meets his new homeroom teacher, Ms. Toriyumi, who notes he's lived in a lot of different places since his parents both died in a car accident 10 years ago and is greeted by a lively classmate named Junpei. That evening, Mitsuru speaks to an athletic classmate named Akihiko about the rising number of acute cases of apathy syndrome as the next day, Makoto hears rumors of normally healthy students suddenly becoming dazed and unresponsive, muttering that something is coming. Later, Makoto is met in the dorm by chairman of the board of Gekko Khan High, Mr. Akutsuki, who observes Makoto retain his human form during a hidden hour after midnight called the Dark Hour, where normal people turn into coffins and are oblivious to the phenomenon. As he sleeps, Makoto is brought to a strange room inside an elevator where he is welcomed by a long-nosed man named Igor to the Velvet Room. He also introduces his assistants, Elizabeth, and her younger brother Theodore, while explaining this place exists between dream and reality. Igor adds Makoto is permitted as a guest because of the contract he signed earlier, explaining their role will be to help Makoto hone his unique ability. That night, an attack on the dorm wakes up Makoto as Yukari tries to protect him from a large monster called a Shadow that chases him onto the roof. She pulls out something that looks like a gun and holds it to her head but hesitates as the Shadow knocks her aside. Picking it up, Makoto hears a little boy tell him to use it and turn it to his temple and Makoto finds himself saying the word Persona as he pulls the trigger. Akutsuki, Mitsuru, and an injured Akihiko look on as he summons Orpheus, the Greek bard and master of strings, but before he can do anything, another being violently tears itself out of Orpheus, the Greek personification of death, Thanatos. Thanatos easily crushes the shadow under its might before reverting to Orpheus again as Makoto collapses from exhaustion. As he rests, Makoto finds himself in the Velvet Room again as Igor explains persona or manifestations of his psyche as numerous as there are personalities. Igor adds Makoto's ability is weak but can be strengthened as he develops social links and emotional ties with others. Waking up, he sees a concerned Yukari by his bedside, telling him he's been out for a week and apologizes for not protecting him. Later, Akutsuki explains more about the Dark Hour and the Shadows, adding that they are the Specialized Extracurricular Execution Squad, or C's for short, who wield their persona to destroy the Shadows. They offer him a position on their team as personas are the only things that can defeat the Shadows and present him the gun-shaped tool called an Evoker he can use to summon his own. Makoto accepts, seeing the first of many social links form with his peers as that night the mysterious boy visits him again, informing him the end of everything will come. The next day, Akihiko brings in Junpei, revealing he too also just awakened to his persona, adding him to the team in the dorm. Eagerly, Akihiko declares they now have enough people to start exploring a place called Tartarus, where they believe they can find the reason for the Dark Hour as it only appears during the Dark Hour and is something of a nest for shadows. Going to get Kokan High, the team watches that as soon as the Dark Hour begins, their school transforms into a nightmarish tower. Yukari notes Mitsuru hesitates to speak on why their school turns into a giant labyrinth, and Akihiko assigns Makoto as leader of a short expedition with Yukari and Junpei, much to Junpei's chagrin. With her own persona, the Greek daughter of Ares and Amazonian Queen Penthesilia, Mitsuru is able to provide support and intel from a limited distance as the group gains some experience exploring the ever-shifting floors of the tower and practice summoning their own persona as Yukari has Io, one of the Greek lovers of Zeus, and Junpei wields the Greek messenger of the gods, Hermes. Finding the dark hours particularly draining, they rest as the next day Mitsuru delivers a rousing speech as student council president and Junpei shares the school is actually owned by her father's company, the Kurijo Group. Working his social links and making friends, Makoto learns his classmate Kenji crushes on a teacher who is already engaged and helps steer his classmate from making any hasty decisions. Next, he helps the sports club's ace athlete swallow his pride and avoid burning out over the expectations of others. He also helps the art club president ignore outside pressure and figure out his future career for himself. He also helps an indulgent cult-promoting student be a little less insufferable. Finally, he helps the French foreign exchange student learn more about and enjoy Japanese culture. 
Seeing his growth as a leader, Mitsuru places more trust in Makoto, offering him a position on the student council to assist her, and he accepts. Within, Makoto meets and helps the strict disciplinarian learn the true value of building trust with others versus seizing power. He also helps the nervous and timid treasurer, Chihiro, build confidence and learn to stand up for herself, gaining her trust and affection. Back in the dorm, Junpei hands Makoto a copy of a once-popular MMORPG he used to play called Innocent Sin Online. Installing it, Makoto meets a girl online role-playing as Maya, wishing for him to play as Tatsuya, and is shocked he gets the reference as they play until the servers get shut down. In the meanwhile, Makoto meets with Elizabeth from the Velvet Room, who tasks him with many errands within Tartarus and around her, mostly out of sheer curiosity about his world. In May, the trio takes some materials to Akihiko in the hospital as he gets a checkup, seeing an intense friend who is helping him look into the rising cases of apathy syndrome. As the next full moon arrives, Mitsuru laments how her persona is extremely limited in gathering data outside of Tartarus but still detects a massive shadow and deploys the team for their first real mission. Junpei openly resents how Makoto was assigned leadership again, as their target is on a stopped monorail train. Hurrying before the passengers are harmed, the team is shocked to find the train moving once they are on board somehow and hurry to stop it before it collides with the next train. Racing against time, they discover the huge shadow in the front car is a powerful manifestation of the Priestess Arcana, and after destroying it, Makoto quickly takes action to pull the brakes on the train, saving everyone. Not long after, Akihiko was fully recovered and ready to rejoin the front lines with his persona, the Greek patron of sailors, Polydeuces, bearing news that they found another persona user, a girl named Fuka. They also observe every time they defeat a shadow, there is a temporary dip in the number of apathy syndrome victims called the Lost, believing their efforts are at least limiting the escalation. Strangely, over the next week, three cases of school bullies disappearing and reappearing unconscious occur, and all three hospitalized victims were friends that hung out together with a bad crowd. Shaken by the rumors of a vengeful ghost being the cause, Yukari convinces Makoto and Junpei to join her in talking to some punks, but her attitude rubs them the wrong way. Fortunately, Akihiko's friend from the hospital, a tough boy named Shinjiro who also went to their school, comes in and forces the punks to back off, guessing the trio was here about the ghost stories. He confirms that three girls hung out here laughing about bullying some girl named Fuka, and people now say it's Fuka's vengeful spirit that did it, as Fuka has been missing for over a week and thought dead. They go to confront Fuka's teacher who tried to cover up the missing student case in order to save his job, as they question another bully of Fuka named Natsuki. Natsuki confesses she and the other girls locked Fuka in the gym 10 days ago, but one of the girls felt guilty and freed her in case Fuka killed herself, and she became the first victim who heard a strange voice call her name before disappearing. Seeing shadows are deliberately targeting humans, and it's not random, Mitsuru tells Natsuki to stay at their dorm tonight as she organizes a rescue mission for Fuka, believing she is still alive and inside the school. More specifically, she's been trapped inside Tartarus by staying in the school during its transformation, and Akihiko adds Tartarus is a space-time distortion, so while it's been 10 days real time, each dark hour is really just an hour, so Fuka has only been gone for 10 hours her time, albeit still in danger. Junpei helps sneak them into school after hours as Yukari clings close to Makoto out of fear of ghosts, and outside, Natsuki is indeed beckoned during the dark hour by the shadows and compelled to follow. The rest of the team is separated as Tartarus forms as it turns out Fuka is the one to find them, amazing them by revealing she's been avoiding all monsters for 10 hours straight thanks to her ability to sense them. Akihiko figures she must have sensory powers like Mitsuru but much stronger, handing her an evoker as Junpei notices how big the full moon is. Akihiko states the phases of the moon influence shadows much like humans, and it dawns on him the attack on the dorm was also during a full moon as well, suspecting a pattern. Hurrying back to base level, they find Yukari and Mitsuru defeated and overwhelmed by two powerful shadows of the Emperor and Empress Arcana, who came from outside Tartarus, as Natsuki is also there in a daze, apologizing to Fuka for how she treated her. Determined to save Natsuki, Fuka pulls out her evoker, sensing how to use it properly, and just as the Empress attempts to crush them, Fuka summons her persona to protect both of them, Lucia, the Christian virgin martyr and saint. Fuka also states she can now sense the weaknesses of their foes as well, as Mitsuru has her take over as handler and guide the group to victory over the deadly duo. After the battle, Fuka passes out from exhaustion as Mitsuru says that even though Natsuki will forget these events, her change of heart will persist and remember her gratitude to Fuka. Later, Akutsuki gathers everyone to say the three girls have regained consciousness in wake of the defeated Shadow, and Mitsuru invites Fuka to join Seize, who is glad to accept. Akutsuki agrees with the idea that the special shadows appear every full moon and will plan around that, though Yukari is quietly irritated at Mitsuru again. Returning to school, Natsuki befriends Fuka and gets others to stop bullying her, as that night, the mysterious boy visits Makoto again, noting his growth in power and wishes to be his friend too, calling himself Pharos. Branching out, Makoto explores more of the city, even escorting Elizabeth as she indulges her curiosities as her fondness for Makoto grows. 
Elizabeth also compiles information on old documents and reports found within Tartarus that hint at a dark history, revealing that they were left behind by the current owner of the antique shop in the mall, who was able to use her research to fuse weapons with personas to make them stronger. Makoto also helps the sports team manager rediscover her love for coaching and helps the old couple who run a bookstore reconcile with the loss of their son who was a teacher at a school. He also finds a lonely little girl hanging around a playground and guides her through the stressful process of her parents getting divorced. Later, Makoto sees Yukari and Fuka play with a very smart Shiba Inu named Korumaru who lives at a nearby shrine and protects it to this day out of loyalty to the late priest he used to belong to. At the next meeting, Akutsuki explains shadows can be divided into 12 categories according to their characteristics and categorized in order by Arcana. He then mentions the four special shadows they have defeated so far match categories 1 through 4 in Arcana order, leaving him to suspect there are 12 total with only 8 left. During the next dark hour, a pale young man alongside a young man in glasses and a girl in a white dress complete assassination contracts while somehow able to free people from their coffins. Meanwhile, Yukari asks Fuka, who is adept at using computers, to look into the history of their school, as 10 years ago a large number of students were reported as absent at the same time shadows were seen, and Yukari brings attention to every time Mitsuru acts oddly whenever people ask about Tartarus, wanting to know if there is a connection. In the meanwhile, the group plans their next operation for the full moon in July, and Fuka confirms a large presence in a love hotel downtown, and Akutsuki comments and explains why there have been pairs of the lost found there recently. Mitsuru now joins the strike team as Fuka handles support operations, and though the group defeats the powerful Hierophant Shadow, they suddenly blank out next to a strange mirror. The next thing he knows, Makoto is waiting in bed for Yukari to finish her shower and join him while a voice tells him to embrace his desires. He fights to regain control of his mind just as Yukari comes out of the shower and regains hers, slapping him out of embarrassment and getting dressed. Fuka contacts them and notices there was a second shadow sealing them in here with magic mirrors around the hotel, and smashing them, the group confronts the lover's arcana shadow behind the mind manipulation. However, as they leave, they are unaware their movements have been observed by the Dark Hour assassins over the past few months. During their next squad meeting, Yukari takes Fuka's findings and confronts Mitsuru on what she's hiding regarding the shadows, Tartarus, and the accident 10 years ago. Mitsuru replies she wasn't intentionally hiding anything, but agrees to now share what she knows. To begin with, 14 years ago, her grandfather, Koetsu Kurijo, pursued research into shadows and their ability to affect time and space. He became obsessed with harnessing and controlling this power, spending years gathering shadows and scientists to study them. Unfortunately, 10 years ago, during the final stages of the experiment, they lost control, resulting in an explosion that killed nearly everyone there, and the creation of Tartarus and the Dark Hour. According to their reports, the massive shadows they collected split into several large ones that escaped, which are the special shadows they now hunt each full moon. The site of their experiment was the current Gekkokan High School, which is why their school turned into Tartarus and those students were hospitalized. Outraged, Yukari says they're just cleaning up the Kurijo group's mistakes, and Mitsuru asserts she never intended to deceive anyone, admitting she did recruit them for their persona abilities, but points out that unlike them, she never got a choice in the matter. Calming everyone down, Akutsuki reminds Yukari the ones at fault are those in the past and they've lost their lives as a result, repeating that destroying the 12 special shadows will fix things. With renewed hope, Akihiko passes this information along to Shinjiro, taking time to reflect on how they have known each other for 14 years since growing up in the same orphanage. At the same time, Itsuru knows Fuka investigated the Kurijo group on behalf of Yukari, but isn't mad, instead asking her to use her company ID to find out as much information as possible about the incident 10 years ago. Over with Yukari, she rereads a letter written by her father 10 years ago, who was the head researcher by the Kurija group on their shadow project, and one of those who died in the incident. That night, Pharos visits Makoto, saying the coming of the end began 10 years ago, around the same time as when his parents died, but assures him he'll stick with him because they're friends. The next day, tension between Yukari and Mitsuru fills the air when it is cut by Akutsuki, who offers they all take a trip after upcoming exams to Yakushima, which is when Mitsuru's father will also be vacationing. As the group looks forward to a beach trip, Akutsuki brings an elementary school boy named Ken to the dorm, not only because he's an orphan living by himself on campus during the summer break, but also because he is a potential candidate as well and Akihiko is shocked to recognize the boy. As the group now travels to Yakushima, they see Mitsuru's stern father and decide to relax on the beach. Junpei takes time to admire each of the ladies in their swimsuits, though Makoto gets the odd feeling someone is watching him. Later, Mitsuru's father tells her she needs to learn to trust others, reciting the guiding principle of the Kurijo group of two in harmony surpasses one in perfection ever since their family separated from the Nanjo group. He is also disappointed she doesn't even trust him, snooping around their databases instead of just talking to him directly. Though she apologizes, Mr. Kurijo tells her to gather everyone as he has already made preparations to disclose everything. 
That night, Mr. Kurijo reveals his father Koetsu's ultimate goal was to use the space-time distortion power of the shadows to create a time manipulation device able to control the flow of time and shape the future to their liking. However, at some point, Koetsu harbored only nihilism in his heart, warping the intent of the experiment, and shows them footage of the incident recorded by Yukari's father, the head researcher. Yukari's father accepts responsibility for the disaster, knowing the risks but was tempted by success, and while the shadows escaping was his fault, he feels he averted a greater disaster for the whole world. All the same, he urges them to destroy all the shadows to end things, and Yukari is shocked her father is at fault for the Dark Hour, Tartarus, and the people who died in the incident. She snaps at Mitsuru again, wondering if she hid this too out of pity, and runs off. Makoto chases after Yukari, and she says for years people blamed her father for everything, and while she defended him and believed in him, seeing the harsh truth breaks her heart. She now feels lost and without purpose, as Makoto encourages her to not lose hope and to keep fighting with them. Warming up to him, she agrees and thanks him for listening, accepting a hug before Junpei breaks up the moment to bring them back. The next day, Junpei tries to lead the guys in picking up girls on the beach, and after striking out with everyone including a thirsty teacher from Inaba, Makoto approaches a blonde girl on a dock who sees him and declares she has been searching for him. Later, Akuski introduces her as Aegis, an anti-shadow weaponized android and the newest addition to their team, as she is the last of her line and only one remaining of anti-shadow weapons that were created 10 years ago. Aegis also commands the persona of Palladian, the Greek icon of protection, meaning she has a will of her own, and she says her highest priority is to be with Makoto. Back in town, the assassin trio meets with Shinjiro and gives him some pills per a regular exchange, but this time they want information on Seize and their mission. Reluctantly, Shinjiro shares that Seize thinks that by wiping out all the special shadows, Tartarus and the Dark Hour will end. The assassins are shocked to hear this, wondering why the group would want to throw away their power and take it upon themselves to intervene. Back at school, Makoto is recruited into a big competition with the sports club, as Ken and Aegis move into the dorm, and Yukari isn't thrilled to see how close the android sticks to Makoto. One night, the squad is alerted to a shadow in the city, and tracking it to the nearby shrine, the group finds it already defeated by Koromaru, who is severely wounded from the fight. Hurrying him to a vet, they are impressed a dog was able to defeat a shadow, and wonder if he's a Persona user too, as Aegis is able to understand the dog and translate its desire to protect the shrine. Traveling for the tournament, the sports club arrives at Yasugami High in the rural town of Inaba as a middle school girl named Yukiko Amagi escorts them to their rooms at Amagi Inn. Makoto doesn't win, but his performance does impress the champ, who sees a friendly rivalry in him, offering to train together. Returning home, Makoto helps the star athlete choose what's best for helping his family, retiring from an aspiring sports scholarship, and taking the more grounded route of getting a job and supporting his mother. At night, Makoto also helps a drunk monk stop running away from the marriage and family he's neglected and realize it's not too late to try and fix broken bonds. Yukari also grows closer to Makoto, as he helps her mend her rocky relationship with her mother, and despite her moodiness, she finds herself falling in love with him. As the next full moon swings by, the team locates the next special shadow hiding in an abandoned underground military bunker, but are intercepted by two of the assassins, introducing themselves as Takaya and Jin, calling their group Strega. Straight to the point, Takaya says they know the group is fighting to end the Dark Hour and they don't want that to happen as it would mean they would lose their powers too. The squad is shocked to learn Strega is composed of other Persona users too, as the duo locks the group in the bunker, hoping they die. Fuka identifies two Shadows of the Justice and Chariot Arcana have combined with a tank, and as the group triumphs again, Mitsuru reports the emergence of Strega to Kutsuki. After the mission, Pharos visits Makoto again, saying the end won't come because of anyone specific, rather, it will come because so many people wish for it. He adds it's not so strange, as this includes those who wish to put an end to their suffering and find peace. Makoto wonders about that, though it's not as wondrous as the convenience of Tanaka's amazing commodities shopping channel. The next day, Mitsuru brings in a recovered Koromaru, with a unique collar evoker affixed to him, introducing the good boy as the newest member of Seas. Korumaru expresses his intent to return the favor of saving his life as he commands the Greek guardian of the underworld, Cerberus. As the group takes summer classes, school nurse Mr. Itagawa explains the modern 78-card tarot deck with its major and minor arcana, and explains how it is a metaphor for an individual's journey through life from beginning to end. Meanwhile, Junpei happens to run into a girl sketching by herself, unaware she is in Strega, as he takes an interest in her, and his frequent companionship begins to wear down on her cold reception as she introduces herself as Chidori. Elsewhere, Ken happens to overhear Akihiko pressure Shinjiro into rejoining Seas, telling him to let go of two years ago when a woman died in an accident Shinjiro caused near the train station. Ken is shocked, realizing they are talking about the accident where his mom died, and a dark intent rises up in him. 
Soon enough, Akutsuki now introduces Ken as the newest member of Seas and points out Ken insisted on joining their team himself alongside his persona, the Greek goddess of retribution, Nemesis. In addition, Igis declares she wishes to go to school too and Akutsuki thinks it would be good to study her in a social environment, though Yukari is once again annoyed by how close Igis sticks to Makoto. After school, Akihiko has Makoto join him in getting Shinjiro to join him and this time giving him no choice. He points out the team now has an android and a dog and they are fighting a group of rogue Persona users named Strega, but more importantly, an elementary schooler named Kanamata joined their team too. Shocked to hear this name, Shinjiro is quick to now change his mind and rejoin Seas, bringing with him his persona, the other half of the Greek horseman and Gemini pair, Castor. The day before the next full moon, Junpei brags to Jidori that he's the leader of a team fighting monsters to protect the world, telling her about personas, and that night Junpei is captured by Chidori, who tells him to order the team to cancel the mission. The group cannot find Junpei, but do find the next shadow is in Polonia Mall, as it has possessed the electrical wiring itself. As the team defeats the Hermit Arcana Shadow, Fuka locates Junpei and Chidori senses this, upset at Junpei and revealing her persona, the Greek princess and sorceress Medea. Junpei confesses he's not really the team leader, and while that was a lie, he was hoping their relationship wasn't. Just then, the team confronts and captures Chidori, as Fuka and Akutsuki are amazed Chidori has a power that evades all of their sensors, and Mitsuru orders her to be held for questioning. Finding Chidori emotionally unstable, Mitsuru has her admitted to a hospital, but she refuses all questioning, as a worried Junpei jumps to her defense, confessing his feelings for her, and to everyone's surprise, Chidori chooses to speak only to him. Time passes and Junpei spends every day comforting Chidori in the hospital, but one day they all see Chidori suddenly gasp and catch a glimpse of her own persona trying to strangle her. Fortunately, Shinjiro is there to give her a pill that suppresses her persona, saying she and the others in Strega are not able to fully control their persona, who can turn around and kill their masters. Outside, Akihiko confronts Shinjiro about the suppressants, knowing about their deadly side effects, and demanding to know if he's taking them too, but Shinjiro evades the question. Akihiko then brings up 10 years ago when his little sister Miki died in a fire while he was too weak to save her. He reminds Shinjiro they both promised since that day to become strong enough to do what they think is right, so it hurts him to see his friend resort to drugs over coming to him for help. Shinjiro replies there is still something for him to do that only he can do, and walks away, agreeing with him to keep doing what he thinks is right. As the days pass, Junpei continues to visit Chidori privately as she reveals her ability to emit life into things, and the two open up more to each other, growing closer. Meanwhile, Shinjiro turns out to have a passion for cooking and loves to take care of Koromaru, as Makoto helps Fuka improve her own cooking too. Early in October, the next full moon arrives as the next special shadow emerges at the train station, though this time Shinjiro and Ken are missing. The group goes on ahead to defeat the unpredictable fortune and strength arcana shadows, and after the battle, Akihiko and Mitsuro realize what date it is and know exactly where the pair are. Explaining a two years ago on this day in the early days of Seas, they were chasing a shadow into a residential area when Shinjiro temporarily lost control of his persona, accidentally killing Ken's mother. Over with Ken, he waits for Shinjiro with his weapon drawn, declaring he'll kill Shinjiro and not opposing him, a solemn Shinjiro urges him to go through with his revenge. He accepts his mistake, wishing he could forget it but was unable to, quitting Seas and school and taking drugs to suppress his persona so no one else would get hurt by him. He is fine with Ken killing him, but warns him that in doing so, Ken will end up like him. Chiming in with agreement, Takaya walks in, saying such is the cycle of revenge. He then takes out his revolver, intending to end their meddling after hiding Chidori, and revealing Shinjiro is going to die tonight regardless of whether or not Ken kills him, as a result of the years of taking the suppressants. Hearing this, Ken objects to being robbed of revenge by killing a man who was already dying, and Takaya counters it doesn't matter, sensing Ken was planning to commit suicide after killing Shinjiro anyway. So, since they were both planning on dying here tonight, he offers to do them the honors, firing multiple times at Ken, though Shinjiro leaps in to take every bullet for him until the group arrives and Takaya retreats for now. With the last moments of his life, Shinjiro tells Ken to let his anger be his strength but to not waste his life going forward, asking Akihiko to take care of Ken now. Standing up, Shinjiro dies on his feet with a smile of relief on his face as Ken breaks down crying, feeling confused, frustrated, and saddened. The next day, the school holds a memorial for Shinjiro as Akihiko mourns his best friend, but builds new resolve to drop his guilt and move forward on behalf of Shinjiro and Miki, as the strength of his will evolves his persona into the Roman general and emperor, Caesar. The next day, he finds Ken at the same spot of now two deaths, as the boy shares his mom died protecting him too, and Akihiko sets him straight that it's up to him what to do next, and the dead are never coming back. To himself, Ken admits he's been running away from loneliness this whole time just to be consumed by hatred and find himself alone in the end anyway. 
Making up his mind, Ken promises Shinjiro he'll see the mission through to the end and finally says goodbye to his mother, hardening his heart and evolving his persona into the Hindu spirit of the Zodiac and Wheel of Time, Kalanemi. Ken returns to the group the next day, resolving to stay and fight, and that night, Pharos points out people die every day, and while it is commonplace, it matters more if it happens to a friend. Back in school, Natsuki is surprised Fuka cares so much that she is moving away, and thanks her for giving her a second chance, and reflecting, Fuka thinks that even if they're apart, they'll still be connected. Realizing her persona allows her to stay connected to her friends, her desire allows her to grow her persona into the roaming queen of the gods, Juno. Later in school, Yukari speaks with Mitsuru, saying she thinks her reason for fighting now is to clean up the mistakes her father left behind, which gives Mitsuru food for thought, as the next full moon appears and the group meets the twelfth and final shadow on the Moonlight Bridge. Waiting for them is Strega, as Takaya fights the group directly this time with his own persona, the Greek personification of sleep, Hypnos, alongside Jin and his persona, the Greek spirit of doom, Moros. As the group wins, Akihiko learns they were the ones who gave Shinjiro his pills, as Jin throws himself and Takaya off the bridge to escape for now. Turning to defeat the final Hangman Arcana Shadow, the group celebrates the completion of their mission, and says farewell to the Dark Hour. The next morning, Pharos visits Makoto, but during the day this time, saying all the fragments of his memory have finally come together, and he now knows what his role is. As this will be their final meeting, he thanks him for his friendship and says goodbye, gifting Makoto with a persona he used after their first meeting, Thanatos. Feasting on sushi the next day, the group notices Akutsuki has taken Aiga somewhere else, as Mr. Kurijo arrives to thank them for a job well done, even though the rest of the world will never know what they accomplished. Dissolving seas, he tells them to now enjoy their youth more normally, as Junpei has them all take a group picture for the memories. However, as midnight arrives, everyone's shocked to see the dark hour is not gone, and hear a loud bell toll instead. Mitsuru gets a bad feeling and mobilizes the group as she leads them to Tartarus, where the sound is coming from. Waiting for them is Akutsuki and a strangely robotic Aegis, and to the group's surprise, Mitsuru accuses Akutsuki of lying from the start to them about ending the Dark Hour and the Twelve Shadows, demanding to know his true intentions. The chairman confirms her suspicions, revealing this was all per plan, and the Twelve Shadows were all fragments that, when destroyed, would reunite into one whole as the entity Death, who will usher in the Fall. The Fall will be the end of the world as they know it, freeing everyone from suffering and despair, and will also mark the beginning of a new world. He also explains he was one of the scientists in the Shadow Project 10 years ago, and says Tartarus and the Dark Hour are results from their successful experiment, not byproducts of a tragic incident. In fact, the entire reason they collected so many shadows was to bring about the prophesied fall, admitting he doctored the original video by Yukari's father who tried to prevent it. Before the squad can do anything, Akuski orders a reprogrammed Aegis to subdue all of them and prepare them to be sacrificed. Hanging up the entire team on crosses, Akuski also captures Mr. Kurijo, who always opposed his father's nihilistic goal, and though he orders Aegis to kill him, she begins to hesitate in following the order. Frustrated, Akuski pulls out a gun, as does Mr. Kurijo, and the two end up shooting each other, with Mr. Kurijo falling first. Akuski orders Aegis to kill the group, but Korumaru leaps in to grab the device controlling Aegis, as Aegis regains her senses and instead frees everyone. Dying, Akuski repeats that this world will continue to fester, and only by destroying it and starting anew can they save it, claiming he was so close to ruling the new world. Laughing, he falls off the edge to his death as Mitsuru mourns her father, sharing he wanted to atone for the past at the cost of his own life, and protecting him was why she became a Persona user, accepting she's failed. The next day, the death of Mr. Kurijo is covered up as Mitsuru is handling affairs as the sole heir of the Kurijo group, and the group only has more questions as to the nature of the fall and why they were to be sacrificed. Fuka finds the original video of Yukari's father's message, wherein he rejects the purpose of the experiment and intentionally caused the incident to sabotage it. With the shadows dispersed, he urges anyone watching to not hunt the shadows as if they recombine, the world is doomed. Seeing this message, and the love her father truly had for her as he died trying to do the right thing and save everyone after all, her heart is now more determined as her persona evolves into the Egyptian goddess, Isis. Soon after, Makoto sees a new transfer student enroll in his class named Ryoji, who is quite popular with the ladies much like Makoto, but is much more forward. However, Aegis finds Ryoji awfully suspicious, declaring him dangerous, though he seems to get along well with Junpei. As the days pass, Yukari tries to reach out to Mitsuru, knowing what it's like to lose a father, and Junpei decides to visit Chidori and keep her company regardless. Meanwhile, the school makes its class trip to Kyoto, staying at an inn with a hot spring. Mitsuru continues to blame herself for the group falling into Akutsuki's trap, as well as failing to protect her father or even lighten the burden of guilt he bore from his father Koetsu for years. Yukari slaps some sense into her, telling her she's not a failure, and like her own father who died trying to stop the shadows, they shouldn't give up working towards fulfilling their last wishes. 
Agreeing, Mitsuru finds a new purpose and appreciates Yukari for helping her out, promising to fight together with her and evolving her persona into the Greek warrior queen Artemisia. Meanwhile, Makoto saves the lives of the boys as Junpei and Ryoji botch their attempt to peek on the girls in the hot springs. Returning, Makoto gets some souvenirs for Ken, who is also a fan of the popular Featherman series, as Takaya and Jin resurface to break into Chidori's hospital ward and retrieve her. She agrees to go, leaving her sketchbook behind, and with her power, Chidori is able to hijack Fuka's senses and speak through her, challenging them all to a fight. Mitsuru senses a trap as Junpei confronts Chidori, pleading for her to stop fighting as the group catches up and beats her in a duel. She says not fearing death and living for the moment is the creed of Strega, and she couldn't stand the heartache caused from being attached to Junpei, as when she's with him, she fears being without him. Suddenly, Takai and Jin enter, seeing Chidori is beyond hope, and as Junpei urges Chidori to leave Strega and come with him, Takaya shoots Junpei directly, killing him swiftly. In his mind, Junpei speaks with Chidori, who admits she was wrong for pushing him away and accepts now that she loves him and wants to be with him, as he returns the same feelings. Refusing to let him die, Chidori transfers all of her life force into Junpei to revive him, now dying in his arms with a smile, saying they are now together forever as one life and she'll protect him. Takaya interrupts, calling Chidori's death meaningless, as Junpei snaps back, evolving his persona into Trismegistus, a fusion between the Greek Hermes and the Egyptian god of wisdom, Thoth, and blows away Jin, who shields Takaya and throws a smoke bomb for them to escape. A few days pass as Mitsuru hands Junpei Chidori's sketchbook, showing him her final work, a highly detailed portrait of him. Junpei takes this as her way of telling him to stop moping and move on, as he now promises to get rid of the Dark Hour, shaking hands with Makoto to show his commitment to grow up and drop his petty jealousy. To herself, Aiga says she struggles to understand what it means to live, but does understand the concept of loss, saying Makoto is special to her, and in order to protect him and the others, realizes something she needs to do now. To the side, Mitsuru orders a full autopsy on Chidori, suspecting there is a link between the Karijo group and Strega, but is shocked to hear her body is somehow still alive after being confirmed dead before. As December begins, the next full moon arrives, and Aigis hunts down Ryoji at the Moonlight Bridge, calling him out on not being human and being her enemy. She adds they once met before, ten years ago on this very same bridge, when they fought and she sealed them away, revealing his true name to be Death. Ryoji confirms he was born 10 years ago as Death, the 13th Arcana that was never meant to be, and he wasn't long for this world as parts of his body escaped him. Even in complete, he was still more than a match for Aegis, as their battle cost the lives of many on the bridge, including the parents of two children nearby, a girl named Katone Shiomi and a boy named Makoto Yuki. Left with no choice, Aegis found both to be suitable vessels to seal Death inside, and as fate would have it, she chose the boy. Since then, the 13th Arcana of Death would live inside the body of Makoto, and without realizing it, would lead him to his 12 missing pieces. His memories and personality restored, Ryoji warns Aegis she cannot win now, easily blocking her full power frontal assault as she overheats in the attempt. Thanks to Fuka, the team locates Aegis and catches up to her as Ryoji approaches them, telling them he is the embodiment of all shadows and union of the 12 Arcana, called the Apprizer, who will be ushering in the one called the Maternal Being. Ten years ago, Ryoji was created when the Kurijo experiment collected a large mass of shadows, but when Yukari's father interrupted things, he awoke incomplete, and then he battled Aegis and was sealed inside Makoto. Ryoji lived inside Makoto for a decade, appearing to him as the little boy Pharos, until his special persona woke up, alongside the Twelve Shadows, all with the intent of becoming one with the Apprizer. Seeing he means them no harm, they take him back to the dorm, where Ryoji says the maternal being is an indescribable entity called Nyx, the mother of shadows. When she arrives, the world will be covered in darkness as all life will vanish and every human will become like the lost, guaranteeing humanity's extinction. There is no way to stop this, as ever since they heard the bell toll and he as the appraiser appeared, the fall has already begun. He says Nyx is already on her way, and their impending eradication will occur a little before spring. Defeating Nyx herself is also impossible as she is the eventuality of death, which comes for all living things once they are born, and is as intangible to them as the flow of time. The reality of being completely helpless in the face of unavoidable doom sobers all of them, as Ryoji says in his human form he can give them a choice to kill him, and in doing so will lose all memory of the Dark Hour and live a blissfully ignorant few months as normal students until the world swiftly ends. Not wanting them to suffer, he adds that like Nyx, he won't truly die, giving them until New Year's Eve to decide, as by that time he will lose his human form anyway and dissolve into the intangible darkness of the Dark Hour. As they return to high school contemplating mankind's destiny to perish in a few months, Makoto hears from Elizabeth how much she enjoys being with him in this world, and encounters a teenager at the shrine who suffers from a debilitating degenerative genetic disease. 
Conversing with Makoto, at first the young man struggles to find joy having accepted the finality of death, but learns to find gratitude for his life, short as it may have been, before passing away. Makoto also encounters a man drinking alone named Vincent, who has been having nightmares where he dies in the end. Trying to take the edge off, he sheepishly admits he's betrayed his girlfriend alongside complications in his relationships, but says none of this really has anything to do with Makoto, so we shouldn't think too hard about it for at least a couple of years. For their own reasons, the group decides if it's all the same, they would rather keep their memories and go down fighting. However, Igis feels useless as she is a machine with no purpose now, and they tell her she is free to choose a new one. She decides for herself her new purpose will be to live, whatever that ends up meeting, and with this newfound will, her persona evolves into the Greek goddess of warfare, Athena. As New Year's arrives, Makoto also considers that while Nyx may be unbeatable, nothing beats the unbelievable savings with Tanaka, figuring he can cheat death by making a deal with the devil. However, Makoto agrees with his allies and tells Ryoji they won't be killing him, and understanding the choice, he reveals his shadow form of Thanatos and tells the group they can face Nyx at the top of Tartarus on the final day, January 31st, 2010. In fact, the tower exists for the sole purpose of Nyx's arrival, and he will be there in his role to usher her into this world. Wishing them a happy new year, Ryoji takes his leave until then, as the group decides to visit the shrine and wish for a great new year in the face of eternal despair. Strangely, a new doomsday cult called Nyx is going around town shouting the end is near, and the group is shocked to see Takaya and Strega are behind them. Later, Mitsuru reveals to them that Chidori is alive, and as Junpei rushes to her side, they see she has completely healed, and while she is in no danger of dying, she has become a normal person. Losing her persona and all of her memories after getting one, including those of Junpei, the doctor says the bedside flowers she used to emit life into were placed on her dead body, and those flowers returned her life force back to her after she died. Chidori says she feels she has been dreaming for the last few years, thinking of a particular boy in her dream she deeply cares about and now wishes to spend her time remembering and finding that boy, and Mitsuru is amazed the two hearts sharing a single life found a miracle. With Aegis, she tells Makoto she's experienced all sorts of new emotions recently, like fear when she fought Ryoji, and confesses she originally wanted to be with him earlier so she could monitor death lurking within him. However, death has left him, and she still wants to be by his side, realizing her true feelings and discovering the concept of love and happiness thanks to him. As the end of the month draws near, the group hangs out together, having fun as they prepare for the end, and make a promise to meet together on graduation day no matter what. With something to look forward to, the Nyx Annihilation Squad sets out, scaling up the hundreds of floors of Tartarus to be halted by Jin. The social media influencer says the three of them were created by Akutsuki, and after they clash, he falls, exposing the history that Kurijo rounded up homeless kids and orphans for their experiments to artificially induce personas and investigate Tartarus. Out of 100 test subjects, only himself, Takaya, and Chidori survived either dying from the drugs, getting killed in Tartarus, or having their own personas kill them. However, the group is forced to move on as shadows surround them and Jin opts to take a grenade and blow himself up before they tear him apart. Beyond, Takaya approaches them, pointing out no one person is actually responsible for reviving Nyx, as it is the will of all people. To the many who have lost meaning in their life or suffer through it, Nyx is the sweet release they all prefer, and their yearning calls her to this world. The two sides clash in their will to live, and while they defeat him, they spare his life, wanting him to live and repent instead. Finally reaching the top of the tower, the group sees Ryoji's ascended form as an avatar of Nyx, and fusing his own avatar Orpheus with Death's own Thanatos, Makoto forms his ultimate persona, the savior of the people, Messiah. As everyone declares their reason for fighting, the Nyx avatar replies that the Arcana is the means by which all is revealed, cycling through every major Arcana in a battle for everyone's souls. As the team knocks down the Avatar briefly, it informs them that if more people in the world held their strength of will, then the fall could have been prevented, but they alone are too little too late. Rising up, the Nyx Avatar reveals the full moon as it splits open, revealing an odd eye-like device underneath. Normal people now wake up during the dark hour, seeing the nightmare around them, as several greet the foretold end of the world and are killed as per their wishes. Takaya laughs at their fruitless struggle, as the group tries and fails to stand strong before the overwhelming force. Seeing his friends fall, Makoto is brought to the Velvet Room where Igor reminds him the strength of his social links will determine his potential, and combined, his friends are his power. A massive ball of energy forms as Makoto's friends, allies, loved ones, and even Tanaka all send their energy to his heart, unlocking a new power to bring about a new beginning or ultimate end. Now able to do the impossible, Igor explains Makoto may be able to break the unbreakable and defeat the undefeatable, as in addition to death, fate has also dealt him the rule-breaking wild card. With the contract between them now fulfilled, Igor thanks him for being a remarkable guest as their elevator finally reaches its final destination. Returning to the battle, Makoto rises up and enters the moon, burning his dread and facing the unfathomable Nyx. 
Against all odds, Makoto was bolstered by the wills of Ken, Akihiko, Mitsuru, Yukari, Fuka, Junpei, Korumaru, Aigis, and even Shinjiro's spirit, as they send him their energy in order for him to form a great seal and prevent mass destruction. Outside, the group sees Tartarus crumble and fall, though are relieved to see Makoto miraculously make it back as the Dark Hour finally ends and with it everyone's memory of their journey. As a month passes, it's graduation day, as the trio are just normal students with no memory of their life or adventure in seas. All the same, the hearts Makoto has touched still remember and appreciate him, including his online girlfriend Maya, who turns out to have been his homeroom teacher Miss Toriyumi, and Tanaka, who gets away with suspected tax evasion. However, it turns out both Makoto and Aiga still remember everything, and during the final assembly, Mitsuru and the others suddenly start to remember their promise as well, rushing out to meet again. As Makoto rests on Aigis' lap on the rooftop, she promises she will always protect him, happy he is her reason for living. A familiar blue butterfly passes by as Makoto closes his eyes for the last time, and all of his friends arrive with their memories miraculously restored, just in time to watch him quietly die. A few weeks pass as the group prepares to move out of the dorm and turn in their gear, though Yukari is suddenly bitter and distant to them all. Mitsuru understands and gives her space as Ken openly wonders why Makoto died when the doctors said there was nothing wrong with him. To cheer them up, Mitsuru arranges a farewell party as they all will depart on their separate ways tomorrow, and that night of March 31st, the news reports apathy syndrome has disappeared, though the influence of Strega's doomsday cult is still lingering. Mitsuru points out that even though they prevented the fall, they didn't reform society after all, but is interrupted as midnight comes and they all sense a strange phenomenon occur. While there is no dark hour, they hear the news say the date is March 31st again and see the devices say the same, as Mitsuru thinks to contact Yukari and Akihiko. Aigis reflects how ever since Makoto died, she has been feeling depressed and seeing the same dream night after night, until one day, all of her emotions simply left her and she found herself more like how she used to be. She sees a shining blue butterfly that perches on her, when suddenly a loud crash is heard as she hurries out to see a strange black android emerge from a hidden room under the floor. She is shocked to see it's the same model as her, as the intruder introduces herself as Metis and is here to protect Aigis. To do so, she tries to kill the rest of the group, revealing she possesses a persona of the Greek goddess of the soul, Psyche, and even a berserk orgia mode like Aegis. Summoning Athena to protect her friends, everyone is surprised to see Athena transform into Makoto's persona Orpheus mid-attack, using its power to subdue Metis. At that moment, Aegis suddenly finds herself in the Velvet Room, greeted by Igor, who says in awakening to the power of the Wild Card, she is now bound to a contract. She will gain the power to wield multiple personas, the same as Makoto, and Igor notes the boy was also able to reach the answer to life. He adds her new power will be a means to attain that answer too, and Aegis wonders if he simply means her death, and he cryptically replies as strength of heart when united is barred by no door. Waking up, Aegis sees she is not only clad in extra armor, but Yukari and Akihiko have returned as well. An overly emotional Metis repeats her purpose is to rescue Aegis, her sister, from the time loop they are currently in, where every day is March 31st. Akihiko verifies this as a couple days have passed just to reset themselves, and they are unable to leave the dorm. Metis explains the abyss of time below them is the cause of the space-time distortion, showing her a desert beneath the lobby filled with odd doors. She says the abyss is connected to the group, which is why she tried killing them in order to break free of the time skip. Otherwise, there may be an answer somewhere in the abyss itself, but the group doubts anything she says, as what she says and what she is makes no sense, but the android evades her questions, pointing out they don't really have a choice but to escape. Mitsuru nominates Aegis to take command, not only because Metis will only listen to her, but also because Aegis has the same strange power as Makoto. Reluctantly agreeing, the group gears up once again, as many of them feel rusty since they settled into peace over the last few months. Delving into the abyss, they spot a strange humanoid shadow enter a door, seemingly leading them on, as they are shocked to see the shadow somehow return. Exploring what feels like a rerun of Tartarus, they follow the black shadow, as Metis says time doesn't flow normally here and there will be many times they will actually revisit the past. To show them what she means, she opens a door that leads them to Polonia Mall, but from June of 2009 several months ago, saying they can only revisit places from their memories, though they are not actually in the past. She suspects the doors also reflect their inner thoughts, as they all wish for supplies and food and thus produce a common image to a location in their past. They also find that while this pocket version of the mall does not connect to the outside world, it does connect back to the dorm lobby. Finding more doors, the group revisits moments in each of their pasts when they awoke their personas, while they notice Makoto's room is strangely sealed. As they find the bottom of the abyss, Fuka mentions she found some research left behind by Akutsuki that mentioned the abyss, stating it came into existence as a reaction to the creation of Tartarus, as when the giant tower emerged, it left behind a giant hole being the abyss. However, the abyss back then had no shadows, and they anticipated it would disappear alongside Tartarus, yet clearly neither of those statements are true. 
Metis thinks there is some force connected to all of them, keeping both the shadows and the abyss here, and in the next door they see Igus's recurring nightmare. In her depression, Igus will cast aside her emotions, and from them, something would be born from her own shadow. A dark cloud now appears before them as Metis figures out this is the monster taking the shape of their regrets, causing the shadows to appear here and prevent the abyss of time from disappearing. The dark version of Makoto attacks them all with his and their own personas, but upon defeating him, the monster born from them would simply dissolve slowly into letters, flesh, and butterflies. Mitsuru sees it was just a shadow, but Junpei counters that it could use personas, and Metis is shocked the group has fought all this time without knowing that personas and shadows are the same thing, hence why they work on each other. Elaborating, shadows are the lower parts of the psyche everyone has, and when humans are unable to face their suppressed thoughts given form, their darker selves break free uncontrollably. But when a human with a special awareness tames their shadow, it becomes theirs to command as a persona. She reminds them that the shadow's power affects time and space, and as such, their personas and their unspoken desire to not move on because of someone they lost has resulted in being stuck here. Realizing they created their own prison, their hearts each manifest a shining key, and Meta says once they use it on the door to leave, the abyss of time will disappear properly. However, because all of them helped create this prison, all of them must now come together to create the exit as well, and the problem is that there is more than one door. There is still the sealed door to Makoto's room that connects to the past, so if they want to exit into their normal present, they can leave through the main door, but if they want to travel to a past with Makoto, they can go through his door. With the key, the abyss will still disappear, so they will be traveling to the true past, but while they decide which door to open, several cracks of light appear in the lobby as the abyss is becoming unstable, and they need to decide soon. Junpei says the obvious choice is just return to the present, and Ken brings up that while they never did find out how Makoto died, the fact is he gave their life to save theirs, and it doesn't seem right to undo that. Akihiko agrees with Ken that they should move forward, but Yukari voices that in her heart, she truly wants to go back before the final battle and take any chance she can to bring him back. Yukari points out this is the time manipulation the Kurijo group first sought with their shadow experiment, and right now they have a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to time travel and fix things. Junpei rejects this, pointing out tampering with the past is too risky in general as there is no guarantee they won't lose this time or cause some sort of dramatic and unintended consequence when altering time for Makoto. Refusing to give in, Yukari says she's willing to take everyone's keys by force if need be, and also jabs at Igus for promising to protect him but still running away now with his inherited power, declaring she won't lose to such a weak will. Mitsuru decides to stand with Yukari as Ken and Akihiko stick together, and Junpei and Korumaru pair up to try and prevent the friends from ripping each other apart. Fuku remains neutral as Meta stays by Igus and leads them all to a coliseum where they can fight freely. She shares this arena as actually where she awakened, confessing she woke up here a month ago by herself, only knowing Igus was her sister and needed to protect her else she would die. She brings this up because she believes the power Igus gained comes at the cost of her life, and again Igus wonders if the answer to life is simply death. She remembers her feelings for Makoto and admits she is just running away, finally making a decision for herself. As Igus and Metis battle the other six members and strike them down in combat, Yukari notices Igus is acting more human again, unlike recently when she reverted back to being mechanical. Earning a bittersweet victory, Igus claims their keys and forges the one true key, which Yukari attempts to snatch away, but it fails to work for anyone other than Igus. Defeated, Yukari says she made a promise to herself on Makoto's grave to look forward and try and change the world so people would stop wishing for the fall, but sees now when given the chance she just wants to see him again above all else. Mitsuru adds the reason she joined Yukari is because when she was down, Yukari helped her, and she promised to return the favor, telling her she doesn't need to suffer alone, while hugging her and reminding her they are all still her friends. Aiga says she has decided to witness the reason behind Makoto's death, and once they know, they can make a better decision with closure, pointing to a third door they can use, the one to Polonia Mall that reflects their wishes with places they have been to before. Wishing for the same thing, the group enters a side door to see the moment of the final battle, right when Makoto performed his miracle in which he became the Great Seal itself. Metis doubts he left with any regrets, as he even managed to keep his promise with them all to meet on graduation day before his consciousness faded away. Though, she points out a seal is useless as it wouldn't work on Nyx, but they are interrupted as a colossal monster reaches out and tries to destroy Makoto's seal, and Fuka senses it's not a shadow. Rather, it is Erebus, the accumulation of humanity's malice and negative emotions made manifest that cry out for Nyx, and is the real threat Makoto is holding back. As long as he prevents it from meeting with Nyx, humanity's desire to be destroyed as a mercy won't be answered. The group understands, as they have contributed to the monster at some point, as well as anyone who hated life, whose life lost meaning, or when the pain became too much to bear, so to them, death is a comfort. 
Suddenly, it turns to the group targeting Igis, who has the same power as Makoto in the seal, and the group agrees this is as much a battle against themselves as it is one to save Makoto and the world. Choosing to overcome their weaknesses and continue living for a better tomorrow, the group triumphs against the Greek brother of Nyx, son of chaos and personification of shadow. Fuku reminds them that for Erebus to truly disappear, the hearts of everyone must change, and the group resolves to do their part by changing themselves and believing it can happen. Yukari starts by apologizing to Aegis for being jealous of her for inheriting his power and accepting her feelings about him. The group also accepts Makoto's death, understanding his reason, and takes comfort in knowing he is always protecting them too. As they all agree to return to the present and move forward, Aegis wonders what her answer to life may be, if not death, and thinks her answer may be friendship. Surprisingly, as the group walks through, Igis somehow pulls them into the Velvet Room with her, as Igor and Metis explain Makoto and Igis were special guests here. Metis adds that Igis can continue to keep her promise to protect Makoto by appreciating her ties with others, and eventually, such positive social links will reach out across the world and more people will stop yearning for Nyx. Igis now realizes Metis is her other half that she wished away when she wanted to return to being an emotionless machine, who came from the Sea of Souls within Igis to help her confront the pain of living. As Igis accepts her now, Metis returns to within Igis, stating she is truly alive now, and Igor says their work here is done as Igis' journey is complete. Igis slumps over as they leave the Velvet Room seeing a familiar blue butterfly, and they all wake up in the lobby as the date now moves forward to April 1st. Seeing Igis' synaptic circuits have burned out due to stress from her new powers, they fear the worst as they try to fix her, but suddenly Igis wakes up when diagnostically it should be impossible. Somehow truly alive, Iga says the joy of living comes from those who care about you, and the group agrees they are never truly alone when they have friends. As the game ends, everyone parts way to pursue their own interests, as when they leave the dorm, Yukari asks Iga if she would be her roommate for the next school year, as Iga looks forward to a brighter tomorrow. Shin Megami Tensei Persona 3 has enjoyed the success of selling over 1.4 million copies worldwide. Thanks for watching the video, what did you think of the new direction for the series? If you enjoyed it then leave a like, watch more Persona recaps, and big thanks to the patron and channel member social links. You guys are the best, thank you for the recent support, and I'll see you on the next battlefield.